everyone. Okay, I just want to make sure we're recording. My name is Caitlin Marwa. I'm the clinical educator for Weeks Medical Center, and I'm just facilitating the Zoom this evening. Oh no, we lost, we lost Jackie. <laughs> what happened? Oh no. Stop, rec stop recording. <laughs> Gosh. Did I, did I boot her out, you think? I double clicked my record. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm still here and I, um, saw the little recording in progress. So. You did, do you still see it, Brenda? Yeah. Okay, I have someone else that's joining right now. Okay. Hi, Robert. Oh, Daryl. Oh, and Jackie's back. Hi, Jackie, are you back? Okay, I think that was just some technical difficulties. I'm not really sure what happened. So I'm just going to start over. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Caitlin Marwa. I'm the clinical nurse educator for Weeks Medical Center, and I am facilitating the presentation this evening. Just some basic housekeeping. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel at NCH for viewing in the future. Please keep yourselves on mute throughout the presentation. There will be a question and answer following the presentation. Just admitting someone else here. So a brief introduction for our presenter this evening, Jesse Raymer, North Country Healthcare Director. Sorry, I'm <laughs> admitting more people here. Okay, great. So Jesse is the Director of Materials Management, Manager of NCH Distribution Center, and Manager of the new NCH Home Medical Distribution Center located in Littleton, New Hampshire. Jesse has spent over a decade in healthcare supply chain. He previously works as a certified radiology technologist, as well as serving in the Army Military Police. He has been Director of Materials Management for the last three years and has been within our system for eight years total. He has spearheaded the organization and rollout of the new NCH Home Medical Distribution Center and is very excited to offer these services to the community. Jesse and his team keep our affiliate facilities of Weeks Medical Center, Androscoggin Valley Hospital, Upper Connecticut Valley Hospital, and North Country Home Health and Hospice, as well as the business and financial offices of North Country Healthcare supplied with the medical and office materials required to keep patient care and services moving. Jesse grew up in, in the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts. Did I get that right? Yes. And has lived all over the United States. Jesse, his wife and young children are settled in Dalton, New Hampshire for the past eight years and are proud to call Northern New Hampshire their home. This evening, Jesse will review current supply chain issues and mitigation strategies, including supply chain distribution and how to respond supply chain lessons learned from COVID-19 pandemic, and discuss strategies of how to mitigate supply chain shortages in the home. All right, I think everybody has been admitted, so I'm gonna hand the floor over to Jesse. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, and thank you everyone for attending this evening. Um, very excited to, to talk about this today. Uh, you know, it, supplies are my passion. It's it's a, sometimes not the most exciting passion to have, but definitely over the past few years, um, a lot of things are happening. And I, I'm gonna discuss uh, today some of what happened on the healthcare side of things, as well as um, some of the things we've, we've seen at home. So let me, I'm gonna share my presentation now. And just thumbs up if you can see that. All right, perfect. So. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for attending. It's, it is a pleasure to be able to speak on this topic today. Uh, in this first section, uh, I'm going to discuss the timeline for supply chain disruptions. Uh, lessons learned from these disruptions in healthcare as well as home. And we are going to have an open discussion regarding mit mitigation strategies. As I speak to the healthcare side of disruptions, I'd like to preface that I'll be discussing primarily medical supplies such as PPE, gauze, plastics, and equipment. And 
things of that nature. We're not going to discuss pharmaceuticals today as that would uh, require a much longer discussion. And I think we would all like to go to bed before midnight. So, so let's start by, um, we're going to do a little bit of a, a time travel here. I'm going to take you back to 2019 to show what the disruptions were at that time. The current slide shows the top 10 trends uh, we were watching in 2019, pre-pandemic. Uh, we had trade wars going on, raw material shortages, recalls, you know, uh, climate change, uh, economic regulations, economic uncertainty, you know, industrial labor disputes, border issues, and even drones, where, you know, there was that discussion going on of Amazon sending drones to people's houses or, or even Domino's Pizza bringing pizza. And that's a discussion that was happening a long time ago. And while this was the norm back in 2019 and these issues uh, were concerning, in healthcare and in our everyday life, we didn't see much change. Uh, back then, Amazon Prime, if you did have it, would actually deliver uh, the items that you ordered uh, within two days. Shelves on the stores were, were full at all times. It was very convenient to be a consumer uh, at that time. The economy relied really on a smooth operation of complex and sophisticated supply chains. The ability at the time to move materials and products in a timely and efficient manner had delivered many benefits to all of us, such as cost reductions, improving technologies, opening new markets, uh, new business opportunities for producers. But little did we know at that time uh, what the next year would bring us. So now we're gonna skip ahead to April of 2020. And I just, I'm going to warn you, the next picture may, may cause a little bit of, of um, a, you know, PTSD of, of something that happened around that time. There it is. This was kind of the first thing, disruption that really affected all of us due to the pandemic. The toilet paper, paper shortage of 2020 due to the COVID-19, um, there were several shelter in place orders uh, at that time, which caused an increase of consumers buying in-home goods. The stores typically uh, stocked weeks worth of paper goods. Due to the change in consumer activity, these stockpiles would last days, in some cases, only hours. Data from Georgia Pacific, which is an American-based paper company, showed the average American household of 2.6 people uses about 409 rolls of toilet paper a year. The company estimated that people would use about 40% more toilet paper than usual if they were in the house all day uh, due to the pandemic. And part of the reason this happened is the toilet paper industry is separated, is divided into two markets. You have the consumer, which is the type of toilet paper we use at home, and the commercial side. And those are those bulky rolls of toilet paper found in public restrooms, offices, restaurants, and hospitals that feel kind of like sandpaper. Uh, the increase in home demand led to the shortage and had manufacturers scrambling to increase production of the in-home product. Now, this is just one of several examples of supply chain disruptions in the United States due to the pandemic. This is essentially when going into a store and seeing empty shelves became a norm and still is a norm to this day. Now I'm gonna give you an example of a healthcare product uh, that was disrupted. This you would see all over the news and this was personal protective equipment. What that refers to is medical grade items like gloves, gowns, face shields, and face masks that healthcare workers use 
when in close contact with contagious patients. And when a highly contagious respiratory virus spread across the world in 2020, and every hospital and clinic in the United States suddenly needed lots of it, the United States just did not have it. So now we're gonna look at a few factors that contributed to that PPE shortage. Number one, government stockpile. This was supposed to prevent this from happening. What the government stockpile is, is a network of warehouses full of medical supplies and vaccines first authorized during the Clinton administration for national emergencies like chemical attacks or pandemics. By 2020, the stockpile was already depleted. The US had dipped into the stockpile during the Obama administration to fight the H1N1 pandemic. And no one, not the Obama White House, Congress, nor the Trump White House invested and built that stockpile back up. Limited manufacturers in the United States, the, PPP, the PPE industry did what many industries in the United States had done. It went global, looking for low cost factories that could turn around orders immediately. Number three, 50% of PPE supply was manufactured in China. This wasn't shocking news at the time. China had built itself into a manufacturing powerhouse, uh, but during this time, Chinese government was buying up PPE supplies and imposed export restrictions and had taken over several of these factories for their own domestic use. Four, and this is always an interesting one, is the competition for product and it, it led to entering what we know now as the middleman. The lack of supply and spike in demand led to an industry of middlemen looking to cash in on the global health crisis. The federal government fighting states who were fighting healthcare systems to get a hold of supplies. We at NCH received a large volume of calls from newly formed vendors that had product in stock or knew a guy that in China that could get us product. And these companies were usually unreliable and always wanted payment up front. So it did lead to a lot of scamming at that time. And the last one, and I say higher per demand in private sector, I really mean the consumer sector, masking laws became the norm during the pandemic. This increased demand in a market where there usually wasn't high demand. So the pe people at home were looking to buy masks as well as the healthcare agencies, dental, everyone, everyone else who was looking for masks at that time. And these are just a few of the main factors leading to the PPE shortage. Healthcare supply chain, I can tell you it, it moved from, I felt like working in a transactional uh, business to almost like working on Wall Street, where you're calling and, and moving fast and trying to get whatever you can. Uh, we, we definitely move more into the procurement side, just trying to buy things and, and not having a huge success rate at doing that. And that was healthcare across the country, not just here. So I hope we learned some lessons and I think we did. So here, here's a few lessons that we learned on the healthcare side. Exploring options for multi-sourcing. It was industry standard to use one primary distributor for about 80% of your supplies. Um, relying on one uh, vendor can cause a single point of failure. So we have expanded to using multi-vendors uh, to get our medical supplies. Investing in supply chain infrastructure. North, at North Country Healthcare, we have made the decision to invest in the medical supply distribution center for our health system. We'll talk about the benefits of that distribution center a little bit later. Expand geographical diversity. Know where the supplies are manufactured and create a hybrid model. So if one fails, there are alternatives. Remove controllable barriers. 
A perfect example up here in the North Country is uh, third party freight carriers. A lot of the distributors and manufacturers won't deliver direct to our hospitals. They'll, they'll rely on a third party trucking company. Well, a third party trucking company doesn't necessarily go on a route every day to this area. They'll wait till they have a truck full of supplies and no matter what it is, health supplies, tires, uh, machinery. So sometimes it would lead to important medical supplies sitting in a warehouse at a third party carrier for sometimes a week or two. And that, that doesn't help. And the last part is stay prepared for the next emergency. Just kind of like the emergency stockpile in the government, they did not stay prepared. Uh, healthcare generally didn't really either. We had a stockpile of supplies. A lot of it became expired, collected dust. Um, it wasn't getting turned into normal rotations into the hospitals or, or clinics. So um, we definitely learned we're not gonna let that happen again. Oops. Yep. And now home strategies for supply disruptions. So this is in the home. And at the end of this, we'll have a little bit of a, a conversation. Um, first, first thing is uh, have a home emergency plan. Just like when the electricity goes out or the water pump breaks at home, you know, you need to have a plan for the basic supplies needed to get by for a few days. Uh, build inventory. Now this can be done over time, uh, having non-perishable food, paper goods, medicine, batteries, and there will, of course, need to be considerations. You know, how much space do you have in your home to, to store some of this? And then uh, the financial impact on your family. Understand what shelf life means. You don't, if you do store supplies like this, you do want to see how long till it expires. As we know, canned goods can, can last for several years, whereas some other goods may, may only have a year of shelf life. Um, sorry, I lost. Sorry, my computer went black for a minute. Um, it never hurts to be prepared. The, the government actually has a website called ready.gov uh, backslash kit that has uh, suggestions for lists you, you should have available in case of emergencies. Three is identify backup suppliers. This is, this is semi-familiar to the healthcare model. Um, let's talk about, you know, something that we relied more heavily upon uh, because of the pandemic, and that's home delivery, right? It's easy to rely on Amazon to deliver, you know, a, a high percentage of our basic needs straight to our doorstep. But there are other sites you may wanna explore as backups. Same goes with going to the store that you typically buy eggs at. And that's kind of something that's happening now. Keep your options open. And, and we are in a part of the country where, uh, you know, people are selling them right out, right out front of their driveway. So, you know, there are other options when it comes to some of these. And the last thing is plan with your neighbor. And I think um, this is a big one. And this is where I want to kind of open this, this room to discussion. This last item, you know, let's take a few minutes to plan with our neighbor. And, and a question that I, you know, you're more than welcome to just raise your hand or do whatever. Uh, what lessons did you learn uh, from the supply disruptions due to COVID-19? I'll open up the room, if anyone. Oh, Jackie looks like she wants to go ahead. Uh, what I learned is to make sure that my iPhone and my iPad were always um, full service. They were always plugged in to have, make sure I was always I had enough juice in there. So if I lose my anything electricity, I would be prepared for that. And, um, and then I'm familiar, I'm friendly with the neighbors. So I have their cell phone numbers handy. So that way, uh, if I need anything, I can call them or they can call me. 
And uh, we have a good area here that uh, we're pretty close knit community. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm always the nosy one. So I, when somebody comes in, I make sure I can get their information. So that way, if something happens, I can call them. And, um, and living alone, I always have a supply of stuff around. And so um, I think I'm doing okay. So far, so good. I can still good. manage. <laughs> good, yeah. I think like the, um, myself, I was on vacation. I think when the toilet paper <laughs> crisis happened and uh, I flew back into Boston and uh, my wife said, can you get some toilet paper? And I drove and checked every store from Boston to Dalton and there was not a single roll. So, you know, sometimes you never know uh, when something like that is going to happen. But uh, boy, it was it was an interesting time. That's for sure. So good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, we'll, we'll keep going. So this, this will now lead me to discuss two projects North Country Healthcare is currently working on to help remove some of the barriers from local hospital supplies, as well as in the home. For the next part of the presentation, I'm gonna go under, I'm gonna discuss two projects underway at North Country Healthcare. One is Central Distribution Center, and the second one is Home Medical Equipment. With the approval of Androscoggin Valley Hospital, North Country Home Health and Hospice, Upper Connecticut Valley Hospital and Weeks Medical Center, North Country Healthcare has two projects currently in process. Number one is a central distribution center. What is that? It's a centralized facility focused on logistics and efficiency to integrate standardized supply chain operations across North Country Healthcare. Why? The exactly some of the reasons we were talking about. Pandemic related lessons learned have demonstrated our traditional approaches to supply chain are not as reliable or as efficient as previously thought. The second portion, and I think that's where I touched on Amazon delivering to the home, is how can we help in the home? So North Country Home Health and Hospice Agency has, has agreed to um, start a home medical equipment business. What is that? It's a new service line to provide enhanced equipment and supplies to residents of the North Country to aid in healing, independence, comfort, and wellness. Why are we doing that? Because we're, we're, our plan is to include an objective to grow and optimize our clinical services. Now I'll take a moment to discuss each one. We'll start with the Central Distribution Center. The current state of our supply chain operations are limited space and we're landlocked. First floor on hospitals, which is uh, typically prime real estate. Our operation, operations are, are segregated. We're operating in isolation with separate purchasing, uh, receiving, inventory distribution. Economies of scale, we are do have group purchasing organization compliance, but not necessarily the economies of scale we'd like. Staffing is limited cross coverage or consolidation due to having to manage all the sites. Logistics, this is the big one. Uh, since I moved up here eight years ago, uh, we have definitely struggled to get tr trucks or distributors or manufacturers to get us what we need. There are logistical issues with trucks to Berlin, Colebrook and Lancaster, kind of the example I gave earlier about third party carriers uh, holding supplies for medical supplies for a long time. Inventory, there's limitations on the inventory control. It led to out overstock and outdates. And also, um, you know, we get into the next part is emergency preparedness. Offsite storage was required at each facility to maintain the inventories we needed for the pandemic. These items were we used a lot of um, to, to protect the, um, our staff as well as the communities. 
These are large bulk items and we just tip, we just did not have the space to store a lot of it. So we had to rent storage containers, storage units and that, that comes as a, at a cost number one and number two, it's limited on what you can actually store in there. And then just general awareness. Uh, before this time, supply chain in, in hospitals um, or really kind of just a, you were a support group, but, you know, just kind of doing their thing and, and, and getting people supplies. And there wasn't really a, a huge focus on investing in it or, or um, the importance of, of something, if something happened like this. The last thing is one of the, the main philosophies of the time. Uh, was known as just in time, and it's you'll see it also might see the acronym JIT. So just in time inventory basically means that once the item is at a certain level on your shelf, whether it's close to twenty five, maybe there's twenty five percent of the item left, the replenishment is coming in to put it back to a hundred percent. Well, with the pandemic, this philosophy has gone right out the window with delays shortages, uh, the, this, this just-in-time philosophy no longer works. And that's been recognized in, in several sectors, including healthcare, that that right now it will not work. So. The future state, this is when the distribution center is, is up and running, there'll be a reduced hospital footprint. We're gonna give back square footage that can be used for, for patient care or other needs to avoid future expansion. Integrated operations will apply best practices and shared processes across all of NCH. Economies of scale will be able to leverage and coordinate purchases to maximize savings. Common sources of economy scale are, purchase, are purchasing bulk buying materials through long-term contracts and um, managerial, uh, having managers that specialize in the certain areas that we need to, to have a successful supply chain. Staffing, uh, we're gonna redeploy staff in the system to reduce redundancy, uh, increase coverage, and we'll share some talent. And actually this, these initiatives that I'm speaking of have, is, the distribution center alone has created two additional jobs in our area, and we are currently hiring for them. So Jackie, if you know anybody, point in my direction. <laughs> Logistics. Uh, we, we did, we chose the Littleton location because well, for two reasons. Number one, it's located right off of I-93. Right off of I-93, we can get trucks that come direct from the distributors to our building. And then we can distribute to the hospitals and agencies as needed. It'll reduce freight costs, reduce service failures, and, and then we'll actually have an intra system courier service that'll, that'll help deliver those supplies to the area. Inventory, we can coordinate inventories to reduce outdates increased turns in the inventory, standardized products. And for emergency preparedness, we can actually have a coordinated system stockpile and we'll be able to rotate this stock to keep it from expiring, which causes less expense on everybody. And then once again, it's general awareness, building an awareness of, of, of what supply chain does now and in the importance of it. We see when it fails, how it affects us from healthcare to home. And we just wanna be prepared for whatever's coming next and, and address it at a distribution center level. Another big portion of it, this distribution center is gonna provide the facility and logistical backbone for the home medical equipment service. And then overall, we're returning 2000 square feet uh, to these hospitals. So hopefully they can, they can open a, an additional service or, or something else. Now we'll get to the home medical equipment side. First off, let's talk about what is home medical equipment. 
Home medical equipment is durable medical equipment, which is wheelchairs, walkers, hospital beds, uh, prosthetics, orthotics, supplies, respiratory and sleep supplies, CPAP, oxygen, nebulizers, wound care, post-acute health, to home health and hospice, post-surgical, home modification, adding handrails, commodes, lift chairs, ramps that are needed, assistive devices like canes, braces, cushions, adaptive devices as well, therapeutic shoes. Shoes aren't built the way they used to be, so sometimes we, we need some better shoes. And then wellness supplies, not so much on supplements, um, but things that focus on health and fitness. We're, we're not doing this to to compete with Walmart, Rite Aid, Walgreens, or, or Amazon. We're just trying to complement and serve the community. The current state of, of regional home medical equipment, uh, there's a very limited physical presence. It's not clear uh, if there's someone there to help. Um, there's no walk-in areas available to, to, to ask for help with home medical equipment. Uh, the companies in the area are for-profit companies, um, and many of them are, are owned out of state. No system affiliations. Um, known service issues. Um, I, since uh, we have begun this project, the stories of, of, uh, of people having to stay in hospital longer because they don't have something as simple as a bed to go in their home. Um, there's numerous stories of that. Um, and then, you know, a barrier for providers when, when a, a provider is, wants to know how, where to refer the patient, um, they don't necessarily know. Um, there's no personal help. Um, and a lot of it is online dropship. And it's, it's a little bit confusing. The future state of home medical equipment will be an accessible physical presence. We will have a walk-in storefront combined with home deliveries and consultations. We are not not profit, not for profit. We're op this is going to be operated as a service of North Country Home Health and Hospice Agency. It'll be aligned with into NC NCH and will create those home care relationships between HME, hospitals, clinics, and home health and hospice. Elevated customer service. Our values and standards help patients navigate complexities. This is gonna be North Country people serving North Country people, and that is a good thing. And then collaboration with providers. We're gonna work with them to find out what their patients need and how we're gonna make it easy for them to get it. Next, we'll talk about the facility. Um, so how do we get to that state? We need a building and there has been one um, under construction or since uh, October of last year that will be wrapping up soon. Right here, I put a, a little picture of it um, and it's located in Littleton right near um, 93. The, uh, if you know where Burger King is down there or the former Pizza Hut, it's kind of in between Burger King and Pizza Hut. Walmart's down over here. We're on the other side. These are actually the latest pictures um, from a few days ago. This is inside of the storefront, the home medical supply storefront, where hopefully uh, later this spring, uh, you'll be able to go in, uh, take a look at some items and, and we'll be able to help you out. Um, this is the front part of the store. Um, and we will be, once again, working with home health and hospice to make home deliveries and, and consultations can happen uh, via, you know, telehealth or even via right here in, in the store. So really the reason we, like, we selected that was um, number one, because of the location and number two, uh, home health and hospice agency covers Coas County and Grafton County. So this is a central location uh, for this business line. And that is all I have for you this evening, Jackie and Brenda. 
Do you do you have any questions? <laughs> um, you answered. Uh, you answered most of my questions. The only thing is, are there any charges if somebody? Um, okay, if if somebody goes to the that, that new building, uh, can they? Do you have to be a patient of the home health agency to get stuff supplies? No. Nope. Okay. So there's 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 a few different ways that we'll be able to provide those supplies. Number one, it is a retail store. So it's the same as going into any other retail store. Everything you can go in there and purchase. The second portion is if your insurance does cover it and there is a, a doctor's order of some sort, we'll work with you to, to make that happen. We'll bill on your behalf and we'll, provi we'll, we'll provide that equipment. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, I had put down where is it going to be, but you showed us a nice picture, so now I know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I hope you stop in once we once we open, Jackie. Well, I'd like to, but I can't drive. All right. So well, I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry to hear. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, I can't see well enough to drive. Uh, they say I can, but I haven't um, because I've got depth perception issues. So uh, it's a little bit nerve wracking. I'm going to try it again this spring. I'm going to try it one more time. All and right. if it's too nerve wracking, I'm not going to do it. But um, I've got a lot of friends that can take me around. But it looks like a very nice place. Yep. So, but it's good tonight to know, to refer people if people have questions. A lot of people have asked me, you know, where do I get this? How can I get that? So now at least I'll have something to tell them. Yep. And, and, um, and, and when we open fully, Jackie, we'll advertise and, and you'll, you'll know the community will know that, that those, um, that that's available. So. Right. Okay. So, um, so, okay. Let's see. That's about, you answered a lot of my questions. I learned a lot. Thank you. All right. It's uh, kind of uh, more stuff. And I like your, uh, what you talked about, your our home strategies for the, Makes me stop and think. I was already kind of ready, but now it's nice to know about it. Yep. Uh, so we can, uh, gives me an idea. I can share that with my people. Good. Uh, Good. That's, I guess that's about, I guess that's about it. All right. Looks like you had a big list there. So I'm glad, I'm glad we could take care of that. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. This was yep. interesting. Yep. yep. So, thank uh, you. Too bad not too many other people listened in. <laughs> That's okay. We only need one. That's it. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> no, it was great. Thank you so much, Jesse. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Take yes, care. Thank you, Jackie, for coming. Nice meeting Good night. you guys. Good night. Good night. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.